I'm going to focus here, interstitial lung disease, of course, is a broad topic, and we could talk about cystic lung disease, whatever. but what I'm going to really talk about here is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and sort of uh, how to think about it, its mimics, and some of the steps that lead out, uh, out to that. And if you, uh, I think, get a sense of interstitial or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you've really gone a long ways to dealing with interstitial lung disease in general. So let's, um, let's go with that. And um, as I mentioned, IPF is a common form of interstitial lung disease and is defined as chronic progressive fibrosing interstitial pneumonia. Uh, if it's I, it's uh, unknown cause. Of course, it can be secondary to some things, and we'll briefly mention those. Um, now, IPF is a clinical diagnosis. When we talk about the pattern histologically, or even perhaps on CT, we may use the term usual interstitial pneumonia. So IPF clinical UIP is kind of pattern-based approach, all right? So they are somewhat interchangeable in the sense that um, UIP can be other things, because it could be secondary, as I mentioned, but IPF is, is sort of the histological correlate of that is UIP. So think of them as being similar, although not entirely interchangeable. Um, generally, what happens is that it uh, progresses, and uh, uh, it classically has been associated with a poor prognosis. So here's my outline. We'll talk just briefly about some clinical aspects. Um, we'll talk about CT, CT technique, uh, the CT findings, a little bit about when it's not IPF and it's PF, secondary PF, and then something about differential considerations at the end. All right, so let's go into a little more on the clinical background. So this is a, g a disease generally of older individuals. Uh, so except for in familial cases and rare other cases, it's not usually found under the age of 50. Uh, there's a slight uh, prevalence in men. I mentioned the symptoms of shortness of breath and cough. And traditionally, uh, it's been associated with a median survival in the three-year range, which is actually worse than a lot of malignancies. So, you know, you think, well, cancer is about the worst thing you can have. This is pretty, pretty much up there as far as bad things. Uh, and when we talk about, uh, we can divide it, as I mentioned a moment ago, into IPF and then secondary causes of pulmonary fibrosis, particularly uh, connective tissue or collagen vascular disease. Now, there has been a game changer in the last few years in the sense, until recently, treatment didn't work. You, you'd get a lung transplant, there was no pharmacological treatment that had been shown to have any effect. That actually has changed. Uh, the, in 2014, a couple of articles came out, two different agents, two different companies, showing that there's a potential to, if not reverse the disease, slow the pro progression. And so this has led uh, to more importance for radiologists, essentially, looking at and deciding, does this patient have IPF? Because until recently, this was the only reason that you could use this drug. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and be uh, talking on this topic, which is an area of interest of mine. It's also a very challenging process um, following up a patient uh, after they got radiation or thermal ablation uh, um, and reading the PET scan. So I wanted to um, share my expertise on this. Uh, I have no uh, disclosures uh, for this talk. My objectives for this talk is number one, we're going to understand the challenges in interpreting PET scans after radiation and thermal ablation. And number two, we're going to learn how to interpret PET scans after radiation or thermal ablation and also talk about the timing of when the follow-up PET CT scan should be performed. Now, the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the epidemiology and the primary lung cancer statistics uh, in the U.S. Um, it's pretty abysmal in terms of an incidence. It's about 228,000 uh, uh, per year. It's fairly equally divided between uh, men and women, as you can see. Uh, the death rate is about 135,000, and it's also uh, uh, fairly divided. It's a little bit higher in men with 72,500 um, compared to about 63,000 uh, women. So if you look at the timing of PET-CT for, um, for radiation therapy, if you're unfortunate to get diagnosed with a lung cancer, hopefully you can get the initial uh, PET-CT quickly. And then 
that depending upon if you're going to get chemotherapy or immunotherapy, depending upon your histology, uh, and if you have more advanced cancer, uh, you're often going to get radiation uh, therapy. So if we look at the timing after radiation therapy, um, you know that can take often about eight to twelve weeks. And then when should you get your first PET scan? Can you get it at about one month? Should you get it at three months? Can you wait longer and get it at six months? And I will tell you that the longer that you wait, the higher your specificity is going to be. But often you have to make, um, or the clinician has to make a management decision and the patients don't want to wait this long before they get imaging. So it's usually about three months. And there are pitfalls about getting at one month because you're going to get a lot of inflammation from the radiation treatment and you may get incomplete killing of the tumor uh, at this time. So you're going to get both false negatives and false positives. So again, some of the factors to consider for timing of PET-CT, um, number one is the type and quantity of radiation therapy. Are you getting a daily treatment over a month or are you doing um, more fractionated like serotactic where you're just getting higher doses over you know, four times or so? I think the most important thing is the clinical presentation, whether or not uh, the patient is doing well clinically, they're asymptomatic, or clearly on clinical exam, they have a suspicion that the patient may be progressing. If you're progressing, then you're going to get imaging uh, much earlier. But typically, if you're doing well, this is very uh, similar to head and neck cancer, you typically want to wait at least three months after radiation therapy. Um, and if someone were to ask you how long you know, should you wait, I would say somewhere around three to six months. But the real best answer is how long before you have to make a treatment decision on your patient. Good morning, everybody. So uh, what I'd like to do is talk about an a area of uh, MRA that we're using quite a lot in our uh, institution. And uh, thank you. Um, this, I, I think, is um, it's been very helpful to us, and that is uh, using MRA for diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. It's something that's a little counter to conventional wisdom, but we've found to be uh, very helpful in our practice. And uh, there we go. Uh, disclosure, uh, my institution receives research support from GE Healthcare and Bronco Diagnostics, and MRA in this indication uh, the, this represents an off-label use of gadolinium contrast agents. So we'll talk about the clinical background, then uh, some of the MR technology that facilitates an PE exam, uh, how to prescribe and perform uh, examples and pitfalls, and then we'll talk a little bit about PIOPED 3 results as well as our own outcomes data that we've seen. So the, uh, this is a good example. This is a uh, uh, somewhat heavy 34-year-old female patient who had a power pick line which limited the bolus for the uh, CTPA PE exam and uh, she had this uh, attenuation difference here in the uh, left upper lobe pulmonary branch uh, and uh, you know you can appreciate the opacification of the pulmonary artery is not all that great in this case and um, well this is one area where MR can be very helpful. She had a very uh, fairly high radiation dose for performing this CTA because she was a very large patient. And uh, six hours later, when um, the uh, tending came in and said, no, I don't think this is a PE, I think this is a flow artifact, uh, but the uh, health staff team wanted some other uh, test to confirm that an MRA PE was done and uh, shows a perfectly normal pulmonary artery. So this really saves this patient a, a six month course of anticoagulation therapy which has its own significant risks.